We're really thrilled though to have been able to make adjustments to the original event that we had planned and to be able to come to you now uh, online to talk about these really important issues um, that should not be deferred for a later date, even though this is a really challenging time for everyone. We are celebrating, or at least uh, marking the launch this week of a year of action against citizenship stripping. This is a joint initiative by the Institute on Statelessness and Inclusion and Open Society Justice Initiative. And we are undertaking activities throughout this year, also in partnership with a number of other organizations. And we're thrilled to be working with the ASER Institute specifically on this webinar and to have a colleague from the ASER Institute also joining as a panelist later on. Uh, it's my task today to introduce you to what we're going to be doing on this webinar, uh, tell you a little bit about who the speakers are and then hand over to them to unpack the issue of deprivation of nationality, in particular in a national security context. Uh, a number of you may have also logged on yesterday to uh, another webinar that we organized where we looked at the wider issues around deprivation of nationality as an instrument in use in the world today. And uh, so today we're going to be focusing in more specifically on the use of this measure as a national security tool. In doing so, I think it's important not to forget the wider context in which we see this uh, measure being put to use and to remember the links to some of the things that also came up on yesterday's webinar. Um, so perhaps you'll allow me to recap just one or two of the things that were said yesterday by our panelists that I think are important to keep in the back of our minds today as we talk about this more specific issue. Yesterday, the speakers addressed some of the historical and socio-political motivations for denationalization. And they reminded us that history and politics teach us to be very wary of the use of this power. Um, this is also reflected in many of the contributions that we received for our World Stateless Report, which was also launched this week which provides uh, reflections from the perspective of philosophy, politics, psychology, international security, and other areas and disciplines. And across all of these, we see very important questions being raised. Um, one of the panelists yesterday put it very, very wisely when he said that we must remember that government's power is temporary. Governments themselves are temporary. And we should think carefully about offering these governments the power to actually exclude citizens from participation, uh, which really goes to the heart of how a democracy is meant to function. We were also reminded by a panelist yesterday that sovereignty actually rests with the people, with the citizens. And so it's important to question to what degree a government can call on sovereignty as a justification to actually exclude its own citizens. We also spoke yesterday about the context in which we sit this week uh, with COVID-19 uh, spreading rapidly around the world and the response also having implications for all of our work, probably for many months to come. We talked about the need for there to be international collaboration to address crises such as these. Uh, this can also very much be said for questions of international security. It's at times when we face crises that we should expect our governments to take action for the good of everyone. Um, viruses and also issues like international terrorism do not respect borders. Uh, they do not discriminate. And so we must make sure that we are taking decisions that recognize this in how we respond to them as well. And I think these are some of the issues that may come up today on the webinar as well. So why a year of action and why are we focusing specifically on the national security context as one area of priority within this year of action? Well, we have seen in the last decade, if not longer, um, that there is a growing instrumentalization of deprivation of nationality. We see this across different contexts. Uh, yesterday, panelists addressed the situation unfolding in India with the National Citizens Registry and the Citizenship Amendment Act causing manifold problems there for access to citizenship. 
Today, we will talk much more about the context in which deprivation of nationality is used against so-called foreign fighters or ISIS fighters, used as a tool of national security. At the heart of our understanding of how this measure sits in the international legal framework lies the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It states very clearly that the right to nationality is a fundamental human right, and it recognizes that no one may be arbitrarily deprived of their nationality. It is taking this fundamental principle as a starting point that ISI and OSJI and other partners have been working for the last 30 months with the assistance and input of 60 experts to develop a set of principles on the deprivation of nationality as a national security measure. Today, we launch those principles with this webinar. And what we would like to do is to take the webinar participants through some of the thinking around why we should be problematizing the use of deprivation of nationality as a counterterrorism context. We will not on this webinar be going into the specific technicalities of what the principles say. Uh, we hope to provide other opportunities to look at these international law principles in much greater detail in future webinars or events. Today, what we really want to focus on is the context, the questions of why and what is the importance of this and how should we be understanding these measures. To help us think about these questions, we have a fantastic panel uh, joining us from offices and, and living rooms and uh, conservatories in different places. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce them to you now. So we will be hearing first from Tina Kastrick, who is a member of the European Parliament for the Dutch Greens. Before becoming a member of the European Parliament, she was also a member of the Dutch Senate from 2007 to 2019. And during that period, she represented the Dutch Parliament in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, where she was active as a rapporteur for the Committee on Migration as well as the Committee on Legal Affairs. In that capacity, she was a rapporteur for the report Withdrawing Nationality as a Measure to Combat Terrorism, a Human Rights Compatible Approach, which was adopted along with a resolution of the same name in 2019. Tineke will talk to us about how this issue first came to her attention and her experience of the Dutch legislative context, as well as touching on some of the issues that the use of deprivation of nationality as a national security measure raises, in particular in human rights terms, and some of the work that she has been doing to promote a more rights-based approach. We will then turn to Matthew Gibney, who is a professor of politics and forced migration at the Refugee Studies Centre, the University of Oxford. He has published very widely on politics and ethics of expulsion and citizenship including most recently an article entitled Banishment and the Origins of Legitimate Expulsion Power, published in December 2020, uh, 2019. Matt was kind enough to also write a reflection piece in our World Stateless Report on deprivation of nationality through a political lens. In this presentation today, he will offer a broader analysis of how and why this measure has, is enjoying a resurgence of interest among states. Uh, discussing some of the issues he brings to his attention in his reflection piece in our report, in which he warns that a new era of banishment may only just be beginning. We will then move to Anthony Dworkin, who is a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, where he leads the organization's work in the areas of human rights, democracy and justice. Late last year, he published a policy brief entitled Beyond Good and Evil, why Europe should bring ISIS foreign fighters home, where he explores the emergence of the problem of I European ISIS fighters in Syria and Europe's response until now, also touching on questions of deprivation of nationality. So he will help us to look further at the current counterterrorism context and the ways in which states have been responding to the foreign fighter phenomenon, especially after the fall of ISIS and some of the approaches taken to this question of repatriation. Finally, we'll hear from Christoph Paulsen, who is a senior researcher at the TMC Atter Institute and coordinator of its research strand on human dignity and human security. He's also a research fellow at the International Center of Counterterrorism in The Hague. Christoph has written a fantastic piece as well in our World Stateless Report, together with Martin Scheinin, where they problematize the idea that denationalization of a handful of citizens is making us more secure. And he will take us through some of those thoughts in his presentation. 
Before handing the floor to this first speaker, I just want to provide some logistical information to those of you who are listening in. You should be able to find a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which will open a window that allows you to type questions to the panelists. If your question is for a specific panelist, please do also note their name with it. And once we have heard from all four of the panelists, we'll be fielding some of these questions uh, to the speakers. So please do make use of this function and ask the questions that uh, are prompted by the discussion. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand over to Tinika for her presentation. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Laura. And thank you also uh, for the organization of this panel for this debate, because I think it's, it's very timely indeed and important to, to, uh, to have this discussed uh, at a, uh, actually even at an international level. Um, my apologies first for my voice. Uh, I, I have a cold. I don't know what virus I have caught, but <laughs> nevertheless, I, I try to, um, to survive during the whole uh, panel of today. Well, yeah, your first question was, how did I uh, get acquainted with a topic that was actually indeed as a member of the Senate? Uh, during the last years, the Dutch government had uh, come up with uh, legislation in, in different stages. Um, uh, broadening the scope of deprivation of nationality uh, in the context of anti-terrorism. First, by expanding the definition of terrorism, so that also if you have a linkage or a possible link with a terrorist organization, that could already be uh, sufficient for um, deprivation of nationality after a criminal conviction. But a few years ago, a more far-reaching proposal was discussed in, in um, Parliament, and that was about the provision of nationality, even without any conviction, criminal conviction had taken place. So uh, that would mean that uh, um, uh, someone who is suspected uh, to uh, uh, behave, to have behaved uh, and supported terrorist organizations abroad, uh, could be deprived of his nationality only by a decision of the Minister of uh, Security and Justice. So no criminal conviction uh, required and uh, the decision uh, could be just based on uh, information, on secret information provided for by uh, the intelligence services. And you can imagine that it doesn't lead to a lot of procedural safeguards. It's very difficult to challenge a decision if you don't know the grounds. And uh, also, uh, there is only a possibility for a review by an administrative court, uh, which doesn't provide for the normal procedural safeguard that you have in, uh, in, in a criminal procedure. So on the basis of fact finding, uh, it's really a matter of marginal uh, scrutiny. Um, and also the administrative judge could also uh, do the scrutiny in the absence of uh, the, the suspect. Actually, that would normally be the case because uh, in, normally that person would still reside abroad. And so so that, that was actually the procedure that uh, if an intelligence service uh, get the idea that uh, a person uh, is active uh, on uh, abroad uh, in, in, in the um, well, actually, it's really targeting uh, uh, jihadists, so to say. And if there is a, a link with a terrorist organization, someone could uh, all of a sudden be deprived of his nationality without having the chance of uh, uh, challenge this uh, presumption, but also even without being informed. Um, so uh, that would, well, refrain him or prevent him from entering into the Dutch territory again. That was actually the whole purpose. We had big uh, debates about it. It was contested in the academic literature, but not so much in the political debate in the second chamber. In the Senate, we had more critical debates about this. Um, actually also because of this different treatment that you get between people with a dual nationality and people who only have a single nationality because this legislation only applies to dual citizens. So we got a debate that, okay, why is it then necessary to do that if there is a dual nationality, if you can deal with it uh, in case of single nationality? Because in that those cases, the minister said, there we don't need it because we can put them in pre-trial detention. We have our safeguards uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, protecting society 
while we are going to undertake a criminal procedure. So that really leads to uh, doubts as to whether it's necessary to take such a far-reaching decision regarding uh, the people who have two nationalities. So there was a lot of debate on, on that, the, uh, the, the, the distinction between two different categories of, of Dutch citizens. Uh, but according to the ministry, there was no such case like an uh, analog situation because uh, if you have another uh, a bond with another uh, country, then it's, it's completely not comparable to if you have only a single nationality. Uh, but it also raised for us security questions. If you look at the Security Council resolution uh, 2178 of 2014, where the Security Council really urges states to uh, cooperate on an international level, uh, meaning that they should bring people who are under their jurisdiction to justice and also make efforts to uh, uh, develop and implement prosecution, rehabilitation and reintegration strategies. What the Dutch legislation actually meant was uh, uh, exporting the security risk uh, outside its own uh, uh, country and making it even more difficult for other countries to, um, to prosecute them. Because uh, if you don't have um, the nationality, if, if, if people are um, on the territory of another country and they don't have competence, it's much more difficult, of course, to bring them to justice and uh, trial and, and detain them. So it creates also more security risks uh, somewhere else, uh, even if uh, we have kind of responsibility for those people as they are born and raised in many country uh, cases in our uh, country as well. So all these uh, doubts um, did not mean, uh, did not prevent the Senate from adopting this legislation because it was part of a coalition agreement. But for me, it was a reason to, uh, to conduct a study in the framework of the Council of Europe in order to see if this is a real tendency, what you also see in other countries of the Council of Europe. And of course, in the Council of Europe, we have important conventions like uh, uh, the European Convention on Nationality and the Convention on Avoidance of Statelessness in relation to state succession. Uh, but nevertheless, it's not completely forbidden, of course, to uh, deprive uh, nationality in case of voluntary service in a foreign military force or if the conduct seriously is pre prejudicial to the vital interest of a state, um, unless it leads to statelessness, of course, which then can only be uh, allowed in case of uh, fraud. But nevertheless, all those standards also require that there are sufficient procedural safeguards, that it's necessary, that it's proportional, uh, etc. So I looked in uh, uh, cases of other countries and I found that it's not a tendency that you see in the whole Council of Europe. Uh, nevertheless, there are a lot of countries who have this possibility of deprivation of uh, uh, nationality in Belgium, France, uh, the Netherlands, of course, Switzerland, Norway, Slovenia, Bulgaria, Denmark, Malta, Ireland, UK and Turkey. But still, we have 47 member states of the Council of Europe. The grounds are all somewhere different. I mean, some, they mentioned serious crime, others disloyalty, etc. But I think in most of these countries, terrorist acts could, be, could serve as a ground for deprivation of nationality. And you see a tendency of, uh, for other countries to also start to incorporate in their legislation. We found it in Finland, Germany, Portugal, and also the Czech uh, Republic. In Belgium, deprivation of nationality can be imposed as an additional penalty uh, in case of a conviction of terrorist crime since 2015. And well, this also leads to the question about uh, the principle of nibis in idem. Uh, isn't that, uh, you know, that you're being punished for a second time for the same uh, crime. However, in most of the countries, uh, a criminal conviction is necessary as a basis for the deprivation of nationality. Um, this doesn't seem the case for Slovenia and Turkey. And as I already said, in the Netherlands and also in the UK, since 2014, the Secretary of State of Home Affairs can deprive nationality uh, if uh, the behavior is seriously prejudicial in the vital interest of uh, the UK. And um, 
I think with my report and also in previous position, the parliamentary assembly takes the position uh, that uh, terrorism should be dealt with primarily by the criminal justice system of the state concerned uh, with the checks and balances, presumption of innocence and, and, um, and, and all safeguards that has to be in place in a criminal procedure. And that preventive measures should only apply for a limited time and at a last resort on the strict conditions. And deprivation of nationality can be uh, seen as such, of course. And um, I think that uh, with my report, it, it has also been uh, taken decision that this is also not the way forward. It's not effective. And the our assembly also found it's even counterproductive to do so as, as I said, it leads to the export of uh, risks. But it's also at odds uh, with international conventions, especially if it leads to statelessness. Uh, only in Turkey, and in some cases, the UK uh, even deprive nationality if it leads to statelessness, um, but other countries do not do so. But then you get the question, of course, if this practice uh, leads to two different responses by a state, uh, another response towards single nationalities compared to the response to uh, dual nationalities. And um, this different treatment is not in line with Article 9 of the Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness and Article 5.2 of the European Convention on Nationalities. And of course, it's at odds with Article 14 of the European Convention on Human Rights uh, related to Article 8, which uh, guarantees the right to private life. And then you can have indeed the question, as my government said, uh, this is not an analog situation. I, I think uh, you cannot say that those are completely incomparable, especially if in many cases it concerns people who are born and raised in uh, the country. And then at least you can say that uh, it's a matter of indirect discrimination as it affects more often citizens with another ethnic uh, origin. And in, if you look at the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, the case Biao, for instance, it was about uh, uh, family reunification. There, the court very uh, made clear very well that uh, uh, making a distinction between Danish citizens who are uh, Danish citizens for longer than 28 years uh, compared to uh, people who have the Danish citizenship for uh, shorter that amounts to indirect discrimination uh, of, um, uh, so, so an, an, a violation of Article 14 and Article 8. So human rights law makes clear that there is a right of, to a nationality and a prohibition of arbitrary deprivation of nationality. And this is clearly limiting the discretion of the member states. And the European Court of Human Rights has made clear that if you assess arbitrariness, you need to take into account if it's in accordance with the law, but also are there sufficient procedural safeguards, including the opportunity to challenge the decision before the courts. But in the parliamentary assembly also makes clear that it's also arbitrary if it lacks a legitimate objective or if it's disproportional. And when can you pose the question, when is it actually legitimate uh, if you do not withdraw the nationality of single nationals, if it's not necessary, apparently, to do that with them because there are other procedures in place, how can it uh, serve a legitimate aim uh, regarding the other category? I think it's very difficult to substantiate that um, because apparently uh, you can deal with it in another way. And at least this reinforces the impression that the instrument of deprivation is more used as a sanction uh, rather than protecting national interest. And that also leads to the question, of course, is it proportional if the individual circumstances are not taken into account completely, such as the level of integration in a certain country, the level of integration in the country of that other nationality. And, um, in that sense, I think it will lead to arbitrariness very easy. And arbitrariness can, of course, lead to deprivation as a political tool. I mean, it's a, it's a very easy way to get rid of your political enemies. And 
it struck me that yesterday's panel uh, debate was also uh, hinting on that as well. And I found it very interesting in my debate in the Parliamentary Assembly that uh, people who were active in the debate also mentioned that, especially people coming from former communist countries that were much more suspicious towards motives of uh, states to use that as an instrument and that they actually warned the Parliamentary Assembly uh, not to have too much trust in the state. And as, as, as was already said yesterday, uh, a government is only there for a specific period of time and the government not always has uh, the aim of protecting its uh, citizens. So I think this is sometimes forgotten, especially in Western European countries, uh, where we just take for granted that the state uh, is aiming uh, to protect all uh, citizens. Um, so now just uh, what happened afterwards, we also had a recommendation, a recommendation that the committee of ministers should come up with a comparative study to see what are the tendency and also to use it for best practices or for criteria uh, guiding countries of the uh, Council of Europe in how to, uh, uh, to uh, adopt and establish safeguards in their anti-terrorism uh, strategies. And uh, the Committee of Ministers uh, replied that it's going to conduct such a comparative study. So I think that's courageous uh, and that's encouraging also that we will get more insight information in, um, in uh, uh, the developments and uh, also as a tool to, to guide member states and how you can do it in a different way without affecting uh, the fundamental rights. My last remark is about the European Parliament where I'm now. Uh, and, and there, of course, you see that the European Commission and the EU is very hesitant towards touching upon acquiring nationality as that's a national competence. But if you come to deprivation of nationality, then you talk, of course, also about deprivation of EU citizenship. And then it comes in the uh, competence of the EU as well, as the Court of Justice also showed in the Rotman cases, where it made very clear that uh, it's a fundamental uh, uh, status of nationals of the member states and that therefore also the principle of proportionality should be taken into account, meaning that the consequence of such a decision for the individual should be taken into account and for his family and also the lapse of times and, and, and all different criteria. So that will be, I think, very challenging in the future to see in what way uh, also we can use the EU instruments to make sure that this development uh, will not uh, go beyond the human rights that have been uh, fought for for such a long time and, and have been established in international law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tineke. Um, you've raised some very interesting points around why uh, we should be looking skeptically at the use of this issue. Um, you've also drawn the connection to a number of different international norms and principles, uh, which are also outlined in the principles that are being launched today, which explain about the prohibition of discriminatory deprivation of nationality, whether it's in purpose or effect. Um, the principle of necessity, as you explained as well very eloquently about if there is no need to do it for someone who has only one nationality, how do you prove that there is a need for someone with two? Uh, and so these are very valuable uh, points as to how we start to understand this from an international law perspective. And it's great to see that the, the Council of Europe has taken this position on using criminal sanctions rather than this measure to address, um, to address the threat of terrorism. Um, this, is, this is a good way to sync, I think, to Matt's presentation where it will be helpful to hear a bit more about why is this measure suddenly popular again if these challenges are what in fact it raises in practice. Over to you, Matt. Okay, thank you, Laura. And I also just wanted to um, congratulate you and your colleagues on getting this year of action against citizen stripping off the ground. It's a great thing and of course, much needed at the moment. Yes, well, what I wanted to do um, in the time that I have available is to briefly say something about the historical context of this recent turn to citizenship stripping, particularly across states of the uh, global north. 
And it's worth starting by stating, I think, the obvious, um, and that is that the taking away of citizenship is an extreme act of state. Citizenship in the modern state, we know, protects a range of important goods. It provides the basis for lawful residence within a specific territory and all that comes, from, um, comes with that, a home connection to people, for example. It's a foothold by which to make uh, governments accountable through voting, running for office and exercising forms of voice. And it typically, it provides forms of protection from a range of harmful uh, social and economic forces. So the loss of these goods may be profound then, even if one uh, has a second nationality. Yet this idea of citizenship as an unconditional status is in many ways a relatively new one. Um, the punishment of banishment, for example, was widely practiced across European societies well into the 19th century and was supported, interestingly enough, by many um, Enlightenment liberal theorists such as Rousseau and Kant. Banishment itself as a punishment fell out of uh, popularity, not because it was deemed inhumane or um, undeserved. It was certainly uh, considered more humane than the death penalty, for example. Um, but it was a practice that was deemed in the 19th century, at least incompatible with a nation state system in which states reciprocally, uh, reciprocally uh, respected each other's right to control immigration and therefore their right to expel foreigners on their territory under some circumstances. Even then, while banishment itself uh, disappeared as a punishment during the um, 19th century as the nation state uh, really starts forming and uh, territorial boundaries and immigration control become much more important. A form of banishment soon emerged, very familiar to us that work on denationalization. In the early uh, 20th century, many countries, including France, the UK, and the US, began to legislate new powers to turn citizens considered dangerous or disloyal into non-citizens, and thus enabling either their expulsion from the territory of the state or the degrading of their status and loss of various citizenship rights within those states. So now we have the appearance in its early forms of denationalization as largely an executive act in response to security threats or disloyal subjects. Now, the emergence and the entrenchment of denationalization power really occurred uh, during World War I in that very hypervigilant, securitized environment uh, in many countries, naturalized Germans uh, became a focus of concern and laws begin to develop um, that, tr that transform this anxiety um, into powers to strip their citizenship. The UK and um, Australia and Canada are um, all examples of that. By the time we uh, reach World War II, we find citizens of Japanese origin who were also interned were the focus in countries like Canada and uh, the US. Not Australia, incidentally, because Australia had a white, um, a white um, Australia policy that prevented the Japanese from becoming citizens in the first place. So that's one way of dealing with uh, those you deem ethnically undesirable. You don't give them citizenship in the first place. And this is not an issue. But of course, during World War II, um, it's totalitarian states that really do the running here with Nazi Germany and fascist Italy using denationalization powers with abandon to disown uh, entire ethnic groups in order to appropriate property and to facilitate expulsion and uh, even genocide in those cases. Now, interestingly, what happens in the post Second World War period is this association of denationalization power with, total with totalitarian uh, rule serves to delegitimize the use of the practice amongst many uh, liberal states. It tarnishes um, the power to strip citizenship. In the post-war period, 
denationalization is also linked to the problem of creating refugees because uh, refugees and stateless people are connected in um, international uh, discussions. And the practice also, particularly across the 1950s and 1960s, comes to be seen as discriminatory and um, illiberal in the way that it picks out particularly um, naturalized citizens rather than uh, native born um, citizens. And more broadly, I think one can say that denationalization starts to appear inconsistent with the emphasis in that period on citizens as rights holders in relation to their states, rather than an emphasis on the obligations of um, citizens. And as a result, what you see over the 1950s, 1960s, and particularly by the uh, 1970s, um, is some countries abandon denationalization laws altogether. Canada is one example of this in the, um, in the 1970s. And in other countries like UK, the Fran uh, France, Australia, um, denationalization laws just simply fall into disuse. Um, states just don't, they may have these laws on the books, but they're used in the very odd case of a Russian spy, but uh, very rarely. So citizenship at this period really does start to look like an unconditional status, a very secure status. So the question is then what happened? Um, and I think a number of factors have come together over the last few decades to bring us to where we are now in this position where citizenship is starting to look a lot more insecure. The first and most obvious, of course, is the rise of Islamist terrorism, which became particularly prominent after September 11th. Uh, this kind of terrorist, um, terrorist, which has resulted in attacks across uh, virtually every uh, Western country of different size, um, is often spearheaded not by foreign armies or foreign powers, um, but by so-called homegrown militants people who share the citizenship, the same citizenship of those that they want to harm and those they want to damage. And the fact that it is citizens that commit these terrorist acts means that they can easily uh, be characterized not simply as vicious or, uh, or uh, merciless criminals, but as betrayers, people that are disloyal to their own country. And in this context, it seems a rather small step for politicians to draw the line and uh, to draw lines of connection and say, therefore, these terrorists deserve to forfeit their citizenship. Now, another key factor that is often um, that is acting in tandem with this is that the perpetrators of terrorist acts or foreign fighters, um, as we're now seeing, are typically naturalized immigrants or the offspring of such immigrants to uh, Western states. And public hostility to um, immigration from non-Western countries um, and typically Muslim majority countries has often been enlisted to support these denationalization powers. It's no coincidence, I think, that the current denationalization debates were preceded by concerns across many Western states about the integration of Muslim uh, citizens into those uh, societies. In many countries, there's a kind of underlying belief among substantial proportions of the population that citizens of Muslim background are nationals in law only, and are therefore not really true and full members of um, society. Um, it's as if the blow of denationalization is somehow softened by the understanding that these citizens never really fully possess that citizenship. I would say that there's nothing really new in this. Historically, denationalization targets have always been a tracer, um, uh, a tracer for ethnic, religious, and uh, national groups who, in spite of possessing citizenship, are already considered foreign in the societies in which they live. Now, a third uh, factor essential to the recent prizing open of um, citizenship 
has been the spread of dual nationality. If we look over the last several decades, we see that states have increasingly relaxed the expectation that, um, that citizens owe them a singular loyalty. And this has opened up the possibilities for multiple citizenship. One result of this change is that states now find themselves with citizens who they can deprive of citizenship without violating international and domestic norms on statelessness. Practically, dual nationality means that there's a country to which individuals that are stripped of citizenship can be uh, sent and which is then obliged to um, accept them. Dual nationality, therefore, we might say, provides states with new opportunities to dissolve obligations towards unwanted and undesirable citizens. So ironically then, the rise of denationalization both affirms, one might say, the strength of norms on statelessness and at the same time demonstrates just how much states would like to escape these norms on statelessness too. Now, if the conjunction of these uh, three factors helps us to understand why deprivation of nationality has reappeared in the political repertoire of uh, contemporary states, where are these countries heading? I mean, perhaps that's a bigger question that we should raise as we go along, but I think the answer is not very clear given the, um, given the historical trajectory. On the one hand, we've seen in some states uh, like France and Canada, effective political resistance to the extension of denationalization powers, at least to the entire dual national citizenry. Um, in Canada, famously, the, um, the, uh, the Liberal Party leader, who is now Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, successfully campaigned against measures on the slogan of a Canadian, is a Canadian, is a Canadian. And in France, attempts to enshrine deprivation power um, into the Constitution in 2015 by uh, Francois Hollande were foiled by critics who saw these powers as uh, gratuitous and at odds with principles of Republican um, equality. On the other hand, if we look at the UK, where um, I'm based, of course, deprivation power, uh, powers have been expanded three times in the last 15 years or so. Um, and the laws have started to extend beyond terrorists to um, other kinds of um, organized criminals in the um, state as well. And indeed, uh, around about 150 people have been stripped of citizenship, according to the figures as we know them, over uh, a two-year period. So it's possible, I would say, that with the end of the war in Syria, if that really is starting to um, unwind, which I think it um, is, um, these denationalization measures may themselves just uh, peter out. Um, particularly if, um, if it's emphasized that they don't work very well and that they continue to be controversial. But there's also a chance that we're in the middle of a kind of radical revision of what citizenship looks like, underpinned partly by this idea of dual nationality. And if that's the case, then uh, we might expect that um, terrorism may be the first stop of these um, um, of these first denationalization powers, but it may not be the final one. Thank you, Matt. That's very enlightening. I think it's helpful to have this wider contextualization of how the measures came to be reintroduced, but also to offset that against the historical use of banishment and later denationalization. Um, and then the fact that at a certain time that was really seen as no longer something for democratic governments to undertake at all. Uh, what we would like to do now is to shift to talk more about the security context in which this measure is resurfacing. And so we will turn next to Anthony from the European Council of Foreign Relations to talk more about the foreign fighter phenomenon more generally and the ways in which governments have been policy making in response. Anthony, to you. 
Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation to appear on this panel on such an important subject. And what I'd like to say really follows on, I think, um, quite well from Matthew's comments, because um, I'm going to talk a little bit about specifically the, the context of um, international terrorism, um, international jihadist terrorism, and particularly this phenomenon of foreign fighters, whereby, um, you know, in, in many countries around the world, I've looked particularly at, at European countries, but it's, uh, you know, a very global phenomenon, you have citizens who are effectively traveling overseas to join these terrorist groups. And then, um, you know, the question is, how do their countries then deal with them um, and treat them in the aftermath of those departures? Um, and that's an issue which um, is a particularly, you know, powerful and pointed one for European countries at the moment, because following the um, the territory of the loss of territory of the Islamic State, the, the ISIS group, um, you know, there are large numbers, hundreds and hundreds of European citizens in that category, adults and children who are being held by non-state groups in Syria. And um, as you said, I've, you know, looked, I looked in my report on the way that European countries have responded to this question of what what should they do? What obligations do they owe to their citizens who are captured and being held overseas as foreign fighters? And I think really the, the point that comes out for me very strongly from this is that, you know, that the treatment of all of these foreign fighters um, really kind of follows in a sort of somewhat similar direction um, to the question of the deprivation of citizenship. In a way, you can see deprivation of citizenship as the kind of ultimate extension of the policy response that we see more broadly, I think, in the way that Europe has handled all its foreign fighters. Um, and in my report, I characterize this response as essentially a policy of externalization, um, drawing a parallel to the kind of externalization policy that we've seen from European countries in response to uh, the surge in migration, migrants trying to reach Europe in the last few years. Um, this idea that, you know, that what European countries are doing is simply trying to keep the problem away from their own territory. Um, but of course, in the case of these foreign fighters, um, the people that they're trying to keep away are their own citizens. Um, but here, I think that, you know, Matthew highlighted something that's very important, which is, I think, um, the response to these foreign fighters is really driven by this perception, which I think is quite a powerful public perception, that in, you know, in leaving their country and in joining this kind of international terrorist group, um, they were in some sense turning their back um, on their fellow citizens. And I think that's a, you know, that's a very powerful concept which underlies a lot of the response um, both the response, you know, as Matthew rightly says, in terms of attempted deprivation of citizenship, but also I think the response that we see more broadly, where European countries are essentially saying, you know, these people are no longer our responsibility. So, you know, we've had these hundreds of people, um, you know, well, thousands who traveled, hundreds who are now being held. And I think in, in the case of ISIS, uh, this perception is particularly strong because the Islamic State, you know, although it never was a state, it was kind of a proto-state, a quasi-state, you know, and it therefore drew people, um, you know, in larger numbers and across a kind of broader range of categories than merely fighters. As we all know, you know, women traveled to join the Islamic State. Um, people went to fulfill different kinds of roles there. Um, a lot of young children traveled and, you know, many more children were, were born there. And so it's, you know, it's a kind of quite a wide range, um, of mostly young citizens who are now being held. And, you know, looking at, at the way that the European countries have responded, essentially, um, they've sort of said, um, you know, these people have left our countries, they've committed crimes in the region, and the response should be to deal with them and prosecute them in the region where their crimes were committed. 
But I think that that really is, you know, kind of sounds in some ways like a principled stance, but I think it's really um, a pretext for trying to keep the problem at arm's length. And the reason that I say that is because um, in the case of the foreign fighters and family members being held in Syria, um, they're being held, you know, having gone to join one non-state group, they're now being held by another non-state group, which is the Syrian Democratic Forces, this Kurdish-led kind of um, entity that controls some of Syria, but doesn't have the, um, you know, the status of a state and also doesn't have the capacity, the capabilities of a state. So it's not really able to try them. Um, and at the same time, there are quite major problems in the ideas of any other um, path whereby they might be transferred to, um, to Iraq. There are a lot of um, legal and human rights questions that that raises, not least the, the question of the death penalty. Uh, European countries have looked at the possibility of some sort of international tribunal. Um, that also, I think, is very problematic. Um, you know, and so in a sense, you see, I think European countries kind of cycling through um, a series of proposals um, and really having come up short. Uh, and so there, you know, you have a situation in which these hundreds of people, men, women, and many children are effectively in limbo. They're in limbo in this very insecure environment um, where there are serious humanitarian problems. The camps are vastly overcrowded. Um, you know, the is very inadequate healthcare. Um, there's no form of education, no prospects for the children. You know, it's the worst possible environment um, to be held for any attempt to, um, you know, de-radicalize the people who are there, offer some prospects to the children that might help them deal with the trauma they've suffered, um, and even to bring to justice those many people there who, you know, really do deserve to be brought to justice for their victims. So, you know, it's a, it's a policy of kind of improvisation, of denial, um, of really trying to, to push the responsibility away, I think. Um, and it's, you know, also I would say in this case, um, and I guess, you know, here again, I think it's an extension of points that um, other speakers have made. You know, this, it's really, um, as Tinika said, it's exporting the problem because effectively European citizens are, you know, are being left um, to the responsibility of other groups, countries or non-state groups that simply have a much lower capacity to um, deal with them in any kind of effective and just way. So, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like a, a constructive solution. It doesn't seem humanitarian or humane. Um, you know, it seems like an evasion of, of responsibility and arguably perhaps legal responsibility. Um, and also I think from a security point of view, it doesn't represent a very constructive approach to the problem. It seems quite short-sighted and counterproductive because these people are being left in, in an environment where, you know, anything could happen. We've seen the um, already Turkish incursion into Syria that's shown how unstable that region is. Um, so for all these reasons, you know, I think there are really strong grounds for bringing foreign fighters home um, and trying them in the, you know, strong, capable European justice system according to the laws that we have. And yet this is really um, problematic politically, and it continues to be problematic. You know, we've seen um, a number of European governments that have tried to bring back quite small numbers. Um, you know, in, in Norway, there was one, um, one woman who was brought back with her children, and this kind of caused a crisis in the, the governing coalition. We've seen a kind of quasi-political crisis in Finland, again, prompted by the idea of, of bringing family members back. Um, so it's, you know, we're kind of, in terms of the, the European position, I think it's a very, um, you know, it's a very difficult um, position that European countries find themselves in, where I think the, the arguments for bringing these people back are quite strong. Um, you know, the 
idea that we're leaving these hundreds of children there, um, simply facing the possibility of indefinitely living in these camps, you know, seems to me horrendous. Um, but simply because that it's difficult to bring the children back without the mothers, and even many states don't want to bring women back because they see them as having been involved in in Islamist extremism, which of course they were in some cases. You know, we're kind of at a stalemate. And speaking to European political figures, they acknowledge that there is just very strong resistance um, to bringing these people back, um, rooted in the exactly that kind of public perception that we've been talking about. That that somehow they, by joining the Islamic State, they have kind of severed their links with their country, and therefore, in some way. You know, if not legally, perhaps kind of in some vague moral sense, there's this feeling that the country's responsibility to them, um, you know, has also been dissolved. But I would argue that that, you know, that's not true legally. And I don't think that that's true morally. I think it, what we're really seeing is an evasion of responsibility in these cases. And so I think there's a, a really a strong argument for countries whose citizens have traveled to join these groups, you know, to assume their responsibility um, as part of a global effort to deal with a wider problem. Thank you very much. Uh, I can see that we're starting to get some questions in now. So this is just a reminder to anyone who is uh, listening in or watching the webinar from their, the comfort of their homes or offices. You'll find a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Please do use that to send us your questions, as we will be going to some of the questions from the audience after the next speaker. Um, I think Anthony has really helped us to understand the wider context in which these measures are being implemented and that it's part and parcel of what he's described as an externalization of this issue. Um, I think it will be good to now hear from Christoph, who can help us to unpack that a little bit further and to kind of tie together some of the different things that we've heard from the other panelists. So over to you, Christoph. Thank you, Laura, uh, also for your kind introduction earlier and for the invitation to participate in this uh, interesting webinar about this very important topic. And in the next 10 minutes or so, I would like to focus on the justification of using deprivation of nationality, namely to protect national security and whether depriving someone of his or her nationality really makes us safer. Uh, but first, it's important to take into account the general context, I think, in which measures such as these were and still are able to flourish. And from the outside, it should also be stressed that terrorism is a serious and widespread problem that must be countered. As also recognized in the principles that we're launching today, states have an international legal obligation to protect all persons in their territory or subject to their jurisdiction, and they have a right to take effective and lawful steps to protect national security. And in recent years, our security landscape has become more complex. Now, one major explanation being the phenomenon, of course, already mentioned a couple of times, of so-called foreign fighters. That is, people leaving their country of nationality or residence to join an armed conflict abroad. And the armed conflict of our times, the war in Syria and Iraq, has attracted more than 40,000 of these foreign fighters from around the world. It has also inspired others who could not travel abroad to take up arms at home. Now, it appears that because of these unexpectedly high numbers and the attacks that followed, governments around the world got a bit overwhelmed and started to frantically legislate and expanding their security toolbox, often without assessing whether the old measures were really that inefficient. And we call this legislation fever, you can see this more often in the terrorism field, where new legislation is often crisis-driven and symbolic in nature, aimed at showing muscles, at showing to the public that something is being done about the problem. And I think it's important to keep this rather emotional, non-rational context in mind before turning to the specific measure of deprivation of nationality. Now, as has become clear from this webinar, this measure has been increasingly used in the name of protecting national security also by Western governments, but does it really make us safer? I think that deprivation of nationality is an excellent example of the symbolism I just referred to. Uh, it aims to communicate the message that certain behavior will not be tolerated and that perpetrators have forfeited the bond with their home countries. And depriving someone of his or her nationality may therefore seem 
like a strong and efficient counterterrorism measure, but it may in fact work against the goals of counterterrorism policy, as was also concluded in resolution 2263, adopted by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe in 2019. For example, deprivation of nationality constitutes an obstacle to accountability and justice, as for example required under UN Security Council Resolution 1373, as it removes an important jurisdictional link for prosecution, namely the active nationality principle, that is jurisdiction based on the nationality of the suspect. And this is also why the counterterrorism prosecutors I have spoken with all indicate they are concerned about this measure. In addition, it is also not what the victims of terrorism want. And they, quite understandably, want justice to be served. In the words of Nadia Murat, a Yazidi woman who became victim of ISIS sexual crimes and who won the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize together with Dennis McGuigan, thank you very much for this honor, but the fact remains that the only prize in the world that can restore our dignity is justice and the prosecution of criminals. Now, besides prosecution, deprivation nationality blocks efforts to rehabilitate and to reintegrate suspects back into society. In the Dutch national newspaper NSA, it was reported in January 2019 that the entire contra-terrorism chain in the Netherlands, including municipalities, the police, and the public prosecution service have therefore turned against this measure. Now, what deprivation nationality actually does is not solve the problem, but shove it temporarily away to other countries, hoping that these other countries will pick it up. Uh, indeed, this measure is characterized by past the buck mentality, which entails that our problem, and we should also not forget that, for example, foreign fighters are still the products of our own societies, is not addressed, but exported, or said more bluntly, dumped somewhere else, making it the problem of others. And this will obviously impact the security of those countries and their inhabitants. Moreover, in the long term, the person deprived of nationality could even become a risk for the national security of the depriving country and the security of the people under its jurisdiction in a case where a person disappears off the radar and manages to get back unmonitored into the country that turned its back against him or her. Now, the UN Counterterrorism Implementation Task Force has likewise stated that, and I quote, deprivation of nationality can be counterproductive by preventing the return of someone who may want to leave a terrorist organization and who does not or no longer constitute a threat. And so the impossibility of returning could backfire and lead to further radicalization. In an open letter to Western governments of September 2019, entitled, Unless We Act Now, the Islamic State Will Rise Again, National security experts, including people such as Richard Barrett, former director of global counterterrorism at MI6 in the UK, and Brad McKirk, former special presidential envoy to the global coalition to defeat ISIS, wrote, and I quote again, Western governments, for the most part, have refused to take their nationals back. Some have revoked their citizenship, others have called for an international tribunal based in Iraq, which amounts to another means of avoiding the tough but necessary responsibility of dealing with their own citizens. And Anthony already mentioned this. And the trepidation is understandable. By blocking the return of people they regard as dangerous, these states believe that they are protecting the citizens at home. In reality, however, this hands-off stance will only create greater danger in the future. The denial of citizenship by their home nationals will bolster their sense of being, in effect, citizens of the Islamic State potentially preparing them to form the core of a future resurgence." End quote. Now, in this review of research on the history of states' responses to foreign fighters and how these actions panned out, Dr. David Mallet has pointed out that, and I quote again, Arab states preventing jihadis from returning from Afghanistan in the 1990s led to waves of foreign fighters spreading to war zones and filled states around the world. Osama bin Laden is exhib exhibit A of the folly of stripping a foreign fighter citizenship and then washing your hands and assuming the individual is no longer your problem. So indeed, uh, politicians may state that national security will be strengthened because the person will be removed from the territory or will not be allowed to re-enter it. However, this constitutes, of course, a very narrow perspective, both in terms of time and place, of the concept of, of security, one that is arguably no longer in sync with the realities of our hyper-connected world, which call for international cooperation and solidarity.
Now, another important aspect to consider is the wider effect of this measure. It does not only impact a person whose nationality has been revoked, but also his or her family, especially children. And it can also have an effect on people further removed from the targeted person, such as his or her friends, neighbors, and other members of the minority group the targeted person belongs to. After all, it was already mentioned, deprivation of nationality can only be applied to citizens with dual nationality, who are often overrepresented in minority groups. And this means that these groups are disproportionately targeted by the measure, resulting in the creation of two different classes of citizens. And this was also concluded by the UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia and Related Intolerance, Tendai Akiyumi, who joined us in yesterday's webinar. Now, people from minority groups may hence feel unjustly singled out by a measure that is not applicable to Mona citizens of the same country, hence designating them as second-class citizens. Now, if people from certain groups, often minorities, see that only their people are targeted by a specific measure, there is a risk, of course, that these people will feel alienated and discriminated against. And in this regard, one needs to be mindful that exclusion, marginalization, and discrimination can be one of the many factors that can play a role in people radicalizing and joining extremist groups in the first place. So to conclude for now, deprivation of nationality is a measure that's not only highly problematic from an international law point of view, as we have heard earlier today and also yesterday, but also from a security perspective. It's not effective and therefore we should abandon it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, the questions have been pouring in during the last presentations. Um, a number of the questions that have been asked actually go to the specific situation of children, uh, which hasn't really been addressed across the yeah. presentations that we've heard. Um, so as I'm sure we're all aware, uh, there, there are a number of different scenarios involving children from a situation such as the case, uh, the, the very famous, unfortunately, case of Shamima Begum in the UK, who was a child at the time that she went out to Syria, um, through to children who are born to ISIS fighters and remain trapped in the camps uh, because of the refusal to repatriate, in effect, their parents and therefore the children as well. Um, Tina, perhaps we can come to you on this. Uh, some of the participants would be interested to hear whether there are specific international norms that are implicated when it comes to children. Um, and there's a question from Chris Nash from the European Network on Statelessness about whether there is more actually that the EU can be doing uh, specifically to ensure that children's rights are, are protected in this context and yeah. to try to encourage uh, repatriation where appropriate. It would be great if you could answer that and then I'll, I'll sort through some of the other questions. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you. This is a, a very uh, important question indeed. Uh, in our resolution, we also say as an assembly that uh, member states should refrain from depriving the nationality uh, of minors. And uh, you see that in many national legislation that there's a, an age limit of 14 years or something like that differently in each member state that they do allow for it, that most of the member states do not use the really the age of uh, 18 years, but so, you know, give themselves a possibility to also go further. I think indeed, if you, if you look at the, the international convention, it's the International Convention of Children's Rights, of course, which is a very important one in this case. Uh, that could be uh, invoked, which, uh, which makes sure that uh, the best interest of the child should be the primary consideration in each act towards uh, children. And this is also established in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU. And, and that could be used indeed in the framework of, uh, of EU. Um, it, it's a very delicate question also in the EU context. I mean, we have had some, some uh, resolutions in the European Parliament uh, where it was even difficult to get some uh, paragraphs on children, you know, in this case. So this whole debate on uh, uh, um, having the obligation to take back uh, uh, foreign fighters is very sensitive even if it comes to children, although you see more compassion 
with children. But then if you really want to have a majority in parliament, there you see uh, well, that people don't want to touch upon this uh, delicate issue. But of course, that would not be uh, uh, for the court of humor, the court of justice, of course. And it could be very interesting if there would be preliminary questions, for instance, to the court of justice, what the charter and the International Convention of the uh, Children's Rights would mean if it comes to the obligation of bringing back uh, people and also uh, giving them uh, the nationality if they are born outside of the country, but born out of uh, uh, parents who have uh, a citizenship of the EU. I think this still needs to be clarified and it would be very good to have some legal decisions on that. And one remark, if it comes to minors, also here the counterproductiveness is an important uh, argument, of course, because you can, you can refrain from um, repatriating them, but uh, as long as they cannot be deprived of their nationality, they stay union citizens or citizens of Belgium or whatever, and at a certain moment, they are able to enter our countries, but then maybe in a much more radicalized state than if they would have been brought back uh, immediately and, and, and put in a program where they really could have sufficient support uh, in, in socializing in, in, in our societies. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to field two questions to Anthony and Christoph together. Perhaps you can both uh, provide your responses. Um, one relates to an issue that I think came into focus through the, the different presentations is that um, this seems to be a politically popular measure because countries would prefer not to deal with the situation of return of uh, ISIS fighters. And I, I wondered whether you might have some reflections on how we might be able to re-educate the public to actually enable the necessary political space um, to take a more appropriate and effective response than this externalization response? Um, and how do we build trust in the criminal law system, which is a more appropriate strategy? How do we educate about repatriation, rehabilitation and reintegration efforts? So that's, that's one question I'd be, we'd be interested in your reflections on. And the, the second relates to Anthony's comment on uh, this wider externalization as a general policy matter for which deprivation of nationality is one clear example. Um, I mean, it seems apparent now that whether you're deprived of your nationality or not, uh, you, you may be denied the right to repatriate as a national. Um, and so the question also to both of you is, how do you see this evolving uh, area in which nationals are, are refused repatriation or at least refused assistance to repatriate and the different uh, approaches that governments are taking in this regard. I mean, certainly now it stands in very stark contrast to the measures being taken in the context of COVID-19, where governments are going above and beyond to inform their citizens abroad, to provide advice and to offer assistance to, for people to repatriate. So um, in, in the current climate, it's, it's very interesting to see these two different areas and perhaps you could offer your reflections on both of those. I don't know who wants to go first, but... Uh... Nope. Yeah, sure. I can say something for us. That's not a problem. I, th I think why, um, uh, with respect to why politicians are very reluctant to cooperate uh, in this matter, uh, um, uh, whereas, as we see now with the current crisis, that this, that this is, of course, uh, much more forthcoming, is that politicians do not really understand um, that this may also backfire um, to them in the longer term. So they're very much looking at um, the short term perspective. Um, and they think this is a sort of a political harakiri, yeah, that if they bring back people, um, that if, if these people are um, then later involved, in a text, then of course they will, uh, then they will hear it from their constituents, and they want to avoid that. But that's of course also based on a bit of a strange concept that you can create this society that has 100% security, which is of course also a fairy tale. And maybe linking it up also to your question on how we can also educate the public. Um, I think it's also important that the public, so um, so we and all of us, uh, 
should also maybe not criticize politicians too much if a terrorist attack uh, happens. Um, you know, this can be related to many uh, things. Eh? Why, why, why an attack happens? It can be a lack of resources. It can be a lack of trust maybe between governments. And sometimes attacks just happen. Um, um, and I think that politicians are very afraid that if it, an attack happens, that it will get all the criticism of the world. Uh, but I think we must uh, live with the reality that attacks can happen. Um, uh, and therefore, we should, um, uh, let's say, not judge uh, politicians that an attack has happened, but only judge them for adopting measures that are not strictly necessary or that are in contravention um, uh, with international law. And I think that's that's maybe an important point to take into account. But why there's cooperation now um, and why there isn't cooperation in terms of repatriation, I think that's really this short sightedness that actually uh, Anthony also mentioned in his presentation. So um, if I can come in, I mean, I, you know, really, I agree completely with what uh, Christoph said. And in fact, I've had uh, um, an official from one European government say to me, you know, that there is this sort of asymmetry because the, you know, they acknowledge that there are problems with leaving these people where they are. Um, and yet, if you bring someone back and they carry out an attack, you know, the responsibility attaches very precisely to the government that took the step. But nevertheless, I think the arguments are, you know, are really very strong um, in terms of security, uh, in terms of, um, you know, not leaving dangerous individuals in an essentially uncontrolled environment, um, in terms of being able to bring them to justice and offer justice to the victims in a, you know, in a proper way that really documents um, the crimes that were committed, um, you know, on a humanitarian basis, um, you know, particularly for the children. But, you know, I think also for, for all of these people, they have a, a right to, to be tried at least. Um, and I think also as a kind of intelligence asset to, to bring people back um, because of the knowledge that they have of, of the Islamic State group, you know, they're many arguments. Um, and I think one thing that may perhaps be effective is, is a sort of maybe a, a gradual process of, you know, we've already had a number of trials um, which have been quite successfully concluded of individuals mm -hmm. for terrorist actions within European countries. Um, you know, the number of attacks linked to returning foreign fighters is not that high. Um, on the whole, European governments have been building up a rather successful record. Um, you know, I think it's important to distinguish this from situations like the 2015-2016 the attacks, you know, which were not just attacks carried out by returning fighters, they were deliberately planned external operations organized from overseas, for which people were sent back to carry out attacks. So that's rather different. But if you exclude those, um, you know, you have a, a reasonable record of success. As Christoph said, 100% success is not achievable. But, you know, overall, I think the balance of, um, you know, the risks and the humanitarian problems of leaving people where they are, and compared to, a, a, you know, a kind of reasonably successful record of, of bringing people home, is, you know, along with this notion, I think, just of a responsibility that we have, um, you know, I'd like to think that that can begin to, over time, to succeed in, in winning around public opinion. The other thing that I'd mention is, um, is the legal question, because I think a number of people brought this up. And, you know, this is something where, which is going through a number of courts at the moment, both within um, EU member states, and uh, at the European Court of Human Rights. And it's again, it's particularly um, in relation to children, you know, whether European countries have a responsibility just to observe the rights of these children, to bring them home and to bring home where necessary, their parents or their mothers particularly as well. So, you know, again, that's another dynamic that I think we could see playing out. Um, but in terms of the, the broader trends, you know, I think um, we're not going to see a sort of, in the near term, a big shift away from the current policy. I think the best hope is the kind of incremental approach that I've been talking about, a case-by-case -case basis. You know, some people brought back on security grounds where they can be tried, some on humanitarian grounds, um, really trying to, 
make us appreciate that these are a collection of, of individuals, you know, with very different histories and situations rather than a sort of faceless mass of terrorists. Um, Matt, we, we have two questions that have come in, uh, which I think are really appropriate to feel to you. Um, the first actually relates specifically to the explanations you were given, giving around why we're seeing the resurgent use of the measure now um, and how it's linked to the perception of uh, terrorism being uh, Islamist in Europe. And uh, the question that has come in is whether we shouldn't be doing more to um, problematize this perception and question why the state responds to right-wing terrorism is so different um, as part of our contextual analysis of, of the use of this measure. Um, and the second question, which would be interesting to hear your reflections on is um, whether deprivation of nationality as a national security measure is undermining international cooperation or the way in which states are meant to be cooperating with one another. And, and if that's the case, why are we not seeing more resistance from other states um, or criticism from other states when uh, mm. some countries are choosing to use this policy, especially given that it isn't approach, an approach that all states are taking. Okay, thank you. Um, two interesting questions. Um, I, I think it, I think it's uh, right to say, uh, to point out examples of the gap sometimes between the way that um, uh, right-wing terrorists with the rise, particularly of fascist groups um, in Europe and uh, far-right populist groups that have been involved in violence are treated versus groups connected to Islamist violence. We haven't had quite as many kind of large-scale um, attacks around that yet, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's possible to draw those connections, but it's harder in terms of very um, specific um, analogous examples that are of kind of equal weight. Um, there's a, the, um, the media itself plays a very big role here. I think that attitudes towards is, um, Islamist terrorism, as I said in my talk, were formed partly um, after a lot of hostility to Islam, um, uh, Muslim migrants was, um, was established within um, Western states. So, we, we face a kind of an uphill battle here. The other part of this is, of course, a lot of right-wing terrorist groups um, are nationalist in nature. They are uh, very much homegrown. They come from indigenous uh, peoples in those states and the people concerned themselves don't necessarily have dual nationality. So um, the same kinds of um, uh, 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 laws cannot necessarily be applied to them. At the same time, I think it is fair enough to say, why are these groups being treated unequally? And to point out the fact that there does seem to be a strong discriminatory dimension in the way that denationalization has arisen. And I think the way that we um, emphasize that too is looking historically, is pointing out the way that in particular countries, the Japanese were picked out at a particular point um, uh, and uh, the Germans were picked out at a particular point and perhaps get representatives of those particular groups to speak out as well and point to the kind of arbitrariness that occurs in terms of who these laws tend to concentrate on in practice. Because at least if you look at the UK, it's almost entirely people of Muslim backgrounds are subject to these um, laws. Um, on the question of um, national security and um, international cooperation, one starting to see some tensions emerge. I would give one example here, which is perhaps um, an important one. We'll see how this one goes. But um, in the UK, uh, the UK has stripped citizenship from one um, uh, person who's believed to be a foreign fighter, which is the, um, the person known as Jihadi Jack, um, who uh, is, uh, was a convert to Islam, grew up in Oxford, is uh, white, um, and uh, he has Canadian citizenship. 
And um, in the case of the UK, they've stripped him of citizenship, something which is very rare. One often doesn't see cases where countries strip citizenship from people that don't come from um, deprived and fairly marginalized southern countries. And I've always thought there's a strong reason for that is there's less backlash in those cases. But in this particular case, where the person is being uh, thrust onto the Canadian government's responsibility, despite the fact that they grew up in the UK, the Canadian government has been very critical of uh, the uh, response or the um, actions of the UK government and has actually uh, complained very publicly about how unfair this practice is. Um, particularly unfair, you could argue, given that uh, Canada just recently got rid of these same deprivation laws. But we could see some action there on that regard, um, some action perhaps raised both in the international public realm and perhaps in the legal realm as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have a, a number of other questions, but I'm watching the clock. So what I would like to do is uh, to allow each of our speakers a chance to provide a, a one minute brief reflection. Um, and I'm going, to put, I'm going to put a very challenging question in their heads for this, um, which has come in from a number of different participants and basically boils down to, okay, if these are all the arguments why this policy doesn't seem a very good one, and these are all the reasons why it is problematic in light of international law, what might be some of the creative or practical responses um, that could be taken to challenge citizenship deprivation and to make international law more effective? So super easy question for which I will give you each a minute super to respond, easy. Uh, and then I will be wrapping up with a few um, bits of information about what to expect from the wider year of action. Uh, so we'll take our panelists in reverse order for this. Um, and Christoph, you've had a good 15 seconds or so to think about this. Uh, so we'll come to you first. So now I think you should be able to, to hear me. Um, no, thanks, Laura, for this. Um, I, um, I think I'm muted now by the host. So that's you. No, we can, we can hear you. Ah, okay, okay, this is that's something different than my, in my screen. Um, so we have heard um, legal arguments, we have heard more arguments, uh, but I think um, what the next step should be is really to focus on the, on the strategic arguments on the long term, um, and that, that ties in a little bit with my final thoughts. So I said also at the beginning of my presentation, I'm not downplaying the seriousness of terrorism, eh? it's a serious, a widespread problem that must be tackled. Uh, but when attacks happen, we should not rush into new measures, but calmly assess uh, what went wrong. Um, that, again, may very well be a lack of resources, lack of trust, rather than a lack of even stricter laws that erode all the norms and values that our society stand for, and that in addition are not efficient and even counterproductive, again, in the long term. So um, it would be good if everyone realizes better, including politicians, that terrorism is a serious problem, but the responses to terrorism can often be even more problematic in the long term, uh, or as formulated much more eloquently by Prince Said al Hussein, who was the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. He said, terrorist attacks cannot destroy the values on which our societies are grounded, but laws and policies can. That would be my final thought. Wonderful, thank you. Um, very eloquently borrowed words there. Uh, Anthony, to you. It was interesting to me to see the way that European governments reacted um, at the time of the Turkish um, incursion into Syria, um, because all of a sudden there was fighting in the area um, where you know a lot of these foreign fighters were being held, and all of a sudden there was a fear that they could escape or they could be freed. Um, and, you know, that somehow concentrated um, people's minds about the, you know, the kind of insecurity of the environment and the lack of control, which I think is one of the strong arguments um, for not simply kind of pursuing this externalization policy. Um, but unfortunately, you know, as the situation there has seemed to stabilize, the urgency has, has gone away. And I think, um, you know, it's an uphill struggle, but I guess for me, it simply is just to kind of keep 
forcing governments to, you know, to confront this, this question, um, not to be able to simply forget about it, not to deny it, not to kind of brush it off. In a way, I think the, you know, the longer these people remain there, um, the children, you know, potentially spending years in these circumstances, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that the, you know, the unsustainability of the current situation um, will begin to become more and more evident. Um, and I think that, you know, that combination of the security aspects and the humanitarian aspects of simply letting this drag on and on and on, um, you know, may have some impact. Um, but I do think, as I said, it's likely to be a gradual process. I don't think we're going to see quick U-turns from governments on this very problematic and sensitive subject. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Matt? Yes, well, I agree with uh, what the previous uh, speakers have said here, but I suppose what I would emphasize in terms of um, international law and making it effective here is just reminding ourselves and reminding the public um, how important this is in terms of it, uh, the reciprocal nature of it, the fact that we have international law because we all benefit from it. And we have a really powerful example here. Do we really want a world where states are dumping the citizens that they don't want onto other states? I mean, this was, historically, we can go back to the problem of banishment and critiques of that too. It's, it's just throwing into our neighbor's yard the stones that incommode us in our own was uh, Becaria's um, critique of it. And we have that here too, because even a country like the UK that wants to um, you know, make its own citizens other people's problems, risks also being in a reciprocal situation where responsibilities are dumped on it too. And that just can't be a kind of rational way of proceeding here. So there are very good reasons why restrictions on deprivation exist in um, international law and perhaps why they should be boosted much, much further. And they are the uh, mutual interests of the actors involved. I think that's a very timely reminder of why we have these international norms to begin with. Um, so I'm glad to pass the floor now to Tineke for the final reflections from the panel and then I'll talk a bit more just briefly about the year of action. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think it fits with uh, what the former speaker said that I, I think it's very important to depart from the idea that it's a matter of sovereignty of the states because of the far reaching cross border impact that this deprivation of nationality has both in terms of integration uh, issues that we have addressed, but also in terms of uh, real safety and security issues. So in, in that sense, I, I really find it exciting to see what the EU can do. I have the feeling it's still in its infancy uh, because of the EU citizenship uh, concept and, and what it does mean in, in the legal and, and political debate. Uh, we have the Council of Europe, of course, but I, I think the Court of Justice could really play an interesting role, especially take into account the effectiveness principle, proportionality principle, and also what the Commission can do as guardian of the treaties, especially also why you see that the Commission is, is uh, well, is, is um, becoming more and more active on integration issues as well. And here you see that if it has a counterproductive effect that you know, this alienation of, of, of migrants because they feel other grounds can be used as well, or, you know, they're a kind of second class citizen. What does it mean for the integration as a whole in the EU? And I think also regarding international cooperation, it was already mentioned a few times that at the UN level, there's a much more critical stance on this development. It could be very interesting to see if there could be a kind of, if you make the comparison with the externalization of asylum and migration policy, we have had now global compacts on migration, on refugees. If we could do something like that on security and come up with more emphasis on best practices for you know, long-term sustainable solutions. And I think we need to find them in more uh, uh, international cooperation between states. And uh, so to strengthen this international cooperation uh, approach, instead of reinforcing and confirming the idea that it's a matter of states 
uh, sovereignty of space, how they deal with their own citizens, because this is not. Hmm. Terrific, thank you. Some very helpful ideas there already and some very strong arguments that I hope will be taken forward and uh, made even more vocally throughout the year of action. I know that we're over time, but we had a few questions also about what to expect uh, in terms of next steps within the year of action. So I want to take just two or three minutes uh, to outline what we have in mind. Uh, first of all, to remind people that this webinar marks the, the launch of the, the principles on uh, deprivation of nationality in a, counter, uh, in a national security context. Uh, they can be found already on uh, the website of the Institute of Statelessness and Inclusion. Um, they are now open for endorsement and will remain open for endorsement throughout the year of action. Uh, already in the run-up to today's launch of the principles, we were fortunate to secure endorsement by 55 individual experts, uh, including three of our panelists and 22 uh, organizations. Among the endorsements, we have four UN special rapporteurs, two former Council of Europe commissioners for human rights, a number of judges, uh, members of the European Parliament, numerous professors of international law from countries as diverse as the Netherlands, the UK, the US, South Africa, uh, Australia. So uh, certainly do also take a look at uh, the list of endorsements. And if you are interested in throwing your support behind the year of action, then joining in endorsing these principles can be one way to do that. Uh, the endorsements are also listed now on our website, and this will be updated throughout the year of action. What more can you expect from ISI in the coming months? Uh, well, one thing is for sure is that while uh, many of us remain in various stages of lockdown, but anyway, uh, regardless of that, uh, based on the positive experience of today and yesterday, you can expect more webinars. Uh, these two webinars, yesterday's and today's, were really about setting the scene for the year of action. But there is a lot more to discuss, including in terms of practical responses and how to work collaboratively. So uh, we intend to organize webinars at least once a month throughout the coming year, some of which will focus on uh, unpacking deprivation of nationality from other disciplinary perspectives. Um, some will focus more on specific country contexts, uh, a number of which were raised already yesterday. Uh, but to look in more detail at, at Myanmar and its 1982 citizenship law, at the citizenship crisis in India, at the ongoing exclusion of Dominicans of Haitian descent in the Dominican Republic, at denaturalization in, under Trump's administration in the United States. Uh, so there are a number of specific contexts that were flagged um, and that we would like to get into more detail on uh, through exploring these with speakers from around the world during the year of action. I also want to mention that we have an explanatory report for the principles themselves, which explains in more detail the international legal obligations uh, which provide the foundation for the principles. We will be developing from this a uh, comprehensive technical commentary that will be published when the principles are formally presented, uh, hopefully with an event at the UN if things are back to normal next year. Um, to uh, mark the end of the year of action. We also intend to produce some further resource packs and some tailored materials, for example, to help universities to use the World Stateless Report, the principles, these webinar recordings uh, to hold their own seminars and to discuss with researchers and students about some of these very different issues that have been raised. Um, we hope to join in joined up advocacy with organizations and individual experts, and we will be tracking and sharing developments throughout the year of action. Um, so during all of this period, for those of you who are signed up to our monthly bulletin, you can expect to see a specialist segment which looks at what are the law and policy developments that we're tracking, what is the jurisprudence, uh, what opportunities and events are coming up. So that's one way to also stay informed about what's going on throughout the year. This is also just to remind everyone that across the two webinars, what we're actually looking at with a year of action against citizenship stripping is to deal with lots of different types of situations. Uh, today's webinar has really focused in on the national security context, um, but we heard yesterday about other contexts as well. 
So we are looking at situations where minorities are targeted for mass deprivation of nationality, where new powers are introduced or existing powers expanded uh, in, as a national security measure, where nationality deprivation powers are being very clearly misused, as we heard also on yesterday's webinar, as a tool against human rights defenders and political opponents. And also where citizens are increasingly being asked to prove once again that they really are citizens and to produce documentation and how this is having an effect on excluding minorities in places like India and the United States. So if you are interested or involved in any of those different situations and you would like to get in touch with us about how you can uh, become more active within the year of action, please do write to us. All of the details are on the website. In terms of what it is that you can do, as I mentioned, one thing is to consider endorsing the principles, either as an individual or as an organization, um, to participate in and promote activities under this banner of a year of action, uh, in, whether those are web-based activities or events in your country, um, to organize your own event or to work with us to deliver joint events, and also to join forces in targeted advocacy. Um, hopefully at a certain stage, also the UN and regional human rights systems will return to a state of normalcy as well. And it will be possible to also use those to raise more attention to this issue through the UN treaty bodies, the Universal Periodic Review. Uh, we heard today also about the Council of Europe and the EU. Um, there are other regional venues that can also be used to, to keep attention on this issue. So yes, the, I can like to end with a general call to please uh, stay in touch with us, especially if you spot developments or opportunities on this issue. Do write to us so that we can also share those more widely through our bulletins and our website updates. And uh, thank you very much to all of our panelists today for your very eloquent presentations and for fielding questions from us very quickly. Uh, we hope to continue the collaboration throughout the coming months uh, and to really start to change the, the discourse on this issue for the better. Uh, so thank you all and uh, thank yeah, you. until next time. Okay, see you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. You.